cool. Um, all right. Thanks. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Good to, good to have everyone here. Um, so my name is Isaac Rajan from uh, Fuse.io, uh, payments focused blockchain and infrastructure. Uh, good to good to have everyone here. Uh, and I guess we'll give a little a quick minute for everyone to say a quick hello, introduce yourself, maybe give a quick uh, quick uh, intro about your company, and then we'll uh, jump straight into things. Uh, Robert, you want to start? Oh yeah, no problem. Uh, hello everyone. My name is Robert. Uh, Robert Vong. I uh, work out of Path Labs in uh, Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City. Um, <clears throat> um, it's an R&D lab and we uh, uh, specialize in building technologies that bring uh, commercial applications to blockchain. For example, we've done projects in payment, gaming, uh, real estate, and also supply chain traceability. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Pekka, you want to say a quick hello? Hi, thank you, Isaac. Thank you, Robert. Uh, my name is Preko. Um, I'm coming from uh, PundiX uh, as a uh, chief ecosystem officer. And uh, PundiX is a company, um, actually the blockchain developer focusing on hardware, the solution for the hardware. And uh, we are focusing on the payment side uh, as well as the crypto payment. And also the merchants uh, will be our uh, target. And we have been, our product has been shipped to over 30 countries by now. And the latest one that we would like to explore is El Salvador. So it's a good news that uh, El Salvador to uh, actually regulate Bitcoin as a legal tender. It's quite exciting. Yeah, definitely uh, exciting, exciting times and lots of, uh, lots of new uh, world and governmental progress happening. Uh, yes. Who you want to say a quick hello? Hello, good afternoon from Cardia Chain. Uh, I'm Hui, I'm the co founder and CTO of Cardia Chain. So, we are one of the blockchain platform, uh, interoperable blockchain platform in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. So, our goal is trying to provide a blockchain solution for Vietnam specifically and then eventually expand it to the whole Southeast Asia. So uh, we build a platform for use in governments, enterprise, um, both private and public blockchain. Um, and uh, we were able to deploy it for a few uh, business models that we'll be talking in a bit later. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Uh, so Pekka, you had a great, a great uh, comment there earlier about you know, El Salvador and new regulation and kind of the, the governments or industries or people changing what they want or what's kind of accessible. Um, what do you guys see as kind of the major trends in Southeast Asia? Um, what are kind of the uh, communities that you want to focus on? What are, what's our, let's say, big focus? Maybe, uh, Pekko, you want to take it off from Taiwan? Sure. Uh, since I'm based in Taiwan, uh, but uh, our headquarters are actually based in Singapore, and uh, we are now applying the uh, Payment Service Act license uh, to be one of the regulated uh, light, um, operator in Singapore. And uh, as you mentioned that the government has been doing a lot of things uh, re regarding crypto uh, side, and I think for us in Asia, uh, especially in Southeast Asia, Singapore is uh, actually stand a quite a leading role to make sure that uh, this is uh, uh, regulated and uh, to follow the international standard and as well as to follow FATF travel rules. So we are being asked very strictly to modify and also to, um, to adjust it, our platform and to comply with the regulations. And um, I believe that that will be the trend in the future uh, for uh, Southeast Asia as well. And uh, we can see also see um, Indonesia, uh, although um, Bitcoin is not a legal tender in Indonesia and, and actually not, e not even the US dollar. So the legal tender is always the Indonesian rupiah. So what we see for Indonesian government, they are uh, very focusing on the blockchain infrastructure development. And we have seen the government is very interested in that part. And uh, I believe that there will be a, some uh, 
interesting activities going on in uh, Indonesia market. And since it's a very, very large uh, population over there, and the people in Indonesia are very, in, very much interested in, in crypto space as well. They see uh, crypto as a commodity. Um, so it's really depending on uh, how the government uh, to look into the crypto space and what, what, how they define crypto is so, so that you can see um, how it's uh, evolved in each country. It's, it's, it's so interesting, I guess maybe it's, we maybe build solutions for the people, but we actually just wait for the government to tell us what we can actually ship or, or give them. Uh, uh, maybe uh, Robert, do you wanna share a little bit more about some of the infrastructure that you guys are developing for these types of uh, solutions and how you kind of see that, see that growing? Oh, you're on mute. Yep, no, no worries. So this is something we've been doing, uh, we've been trying to commercialize since about 2018, 2019. And the learnings that we've had is that we're probably a little bit too early. Um, uh, blockchain is fundamentally so different from what we have uh, in terms of the, the trustless nature that, for example, if I held uh, some tokens uh, related to some real estate, and um, <clears throat> if, I, if I died, yeah, let's say, um, the law has no way to uh, no, no no way to handle it, you know. Um, it has it, uh, uh, blockchain uh, potentially uh, intersects with so many so many aspects of the law, so many aspects of our lives. For example, um, uh, banking regulations, um, banking uh, payments falls under that. Not only that, but inheritance. Um, uh, um, if I go bankrupt, you know, uh, if I lose the key, um, there. Are, so many parts of the law that have never considered this possibility before that it's uh, that important changes won't happen overnight um so as we explored all these options over the last few years we realized that we really have to work hand in hand with regulators in order for this thing to work um, that was the big takeaway um in terms of uh, southeast asia the southeast asia market you know it's a large it's a large area of 655 uh, million population, about 9-10% of the world. Um, on average, it's only 5K uh, GDP per capita. Uh, this is 13 times less than the US. And uh, there are large uh, wealth disparities as well between say Singapore and Vietnam, where it's only uh, our uh, GDP per capita is only about maybe 2K. And so um, I think uh, blockchain has a role in unifying this entire, uh, this entire area. Um, in terms of uh, uh, payments, of course, this is what uh, you, Isaac and Pico do. Um, but I think the bigger picture here is really for trade settlement. It's for uh, improving financial inclusion. And it's also for um, making uh, financial services more accessible to people um, that, don't have, uh, that don't have these things. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think many of the people in the blockchain sphere have come and joined the ecosystem because of the uh, opportunity to bring accessibility to the unbanked, to the people who couldn't necessarily uh, work or, and or have access to those financial tools. Um, I think also we're seeing a massive migration of uh, workers and especially with COVID and the opportunity to work online. Um, recently we had the like, uh, conference in Miami and you'll see a lot of the like typical New York SF where we talk about those 13, 25 X salaries, uh, um, moving to Miami, moving to Puerto Rico, the concept of, I have to be in America to get an American wage, uh, isn't necessarily, uh, playing into the, to the modern world. So, um, who do you want to maybe share a little bit at cardio chain? I'm sure there's some, uh, interactions with the Vietnamese government and maybe some, you know, uh, things that they're supporting, things that are harder to push. Do you want to maybe give a little more insight into what's happening on the ground there? Yes, of course. Thank you. So in general, I think Vietnam and Southeast Asia have the same sort of like backgrounds and culture. Um, we are one of the area with a lot of population. I think Robert just mentioned the 5 to 10%, uh, 290 percent uh, 290 million people over here is unbanked and underserved, 
right? Uh, also, all of the countries here are developing countries, maybe except from Singapore. So that means there is a great need for infrastructure, right? Uh, both in technologies and in financial. Uh, and then also there is a uh, young populations very eager to uh, participate in anything new. Pretty much there is uh, nothing here to compete against, right? Like if you go to Europe, or UK, or or US at the moment, it would be very hard for you to rebuild the whole entire infrastructure from scratch. Uh, but over here you can. There is no, you know, payment system. There is a big population that doesn't even have a bank account. So um, I think blockchain technologies and cryptocurrency in a way come in just the right time. And um, in general, uh, many government here is very progressive. They are they're eager to, um, to, to, to understand, to explore uh, new technologies and see how it could bring the benefits or the bad value to, to their country. Um, however, some of the topic like cryptocurrency, the regulation payment is still of a gray area. Um, so the way we're trying to do is more touching uh, on all the points, all the you know, obvious uh, products or things that can help. Right? So blockchain technology comes in many ways, many shapes and provide many different solutions. Um, when we are trying to communicate with both the, uh, you know, government in a way, uh, enterprise, big corps over here, I would say the general perception is very open. They're willing to sit down with you to understand how your technology is helping them uh, better than the traditional way. Uh, most of the companies and the government you try to do is digitalize. Um, their, their information. And, uh, and for many of these challenges, uh, blockchain is a right solution. So I would say in general, uh, we, we have a much better hit rate than when you would compare the kinds of uh, discussion you could have for like a Western or a more developed country. So that is what we, what we feel so far. Yes, I guess um, maybe the uh, we, we sometimes talk about certain regions almost uh, skipped uh, credit cards, right? They went from cash or, and maybe not even bank accounts to like mobile payments. Um, and we often see uh, regions get access to new technology, but didn't get access to the intermediary technology. Um, one of the things we always or often think about in the payment space um, is maybe access to smartphones. Um, and in some place, it's like a no brainer. Um, I'd say in Southeast Asia is one of those places, whereas Africa having a smartphone isn't necessarily a given. Um, do you, um, maybe Robert, you want to share a little bit um, when you guys are building out this infrastructure, what do you think are the biggest barriers to entry to the space? And what are some of the, let's say, infrastructure or new technologies that you're excited about that um, you know, are helping uh, solve those problems? Okay, so um, besides the scalability question, um, there are you know, layer two, layer three solutions that are trying to address this. I'd say the um, traditionally what governments have tried to do is uh, uh, manage the on and off ramps if you can uh, manage the, the fiat to crypto or cri uh, crypto to fiat of uh, ramps, then more or less you control the, the supply of users. And for the average user, um, really they don't care about the technology. They don't care if it's blockchain or not blockchain. They've got a, a need. And as long as you can meet it in a, in a fairly efficient way, that's what's important to them. And um, uh, from my experience, I would say having a, having a good wallet, wallet really matters, yeah? So this wallet, should it be mobile? Yeah, it's important if it's in uh, Southeast Asia where everyone has a smartphone. But like you mentioned, if it's in, um, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, then what? Um, these guys might still be using a, a feature phone today. Um, and so having a, a good wallet, having good uh, integration into the browser, I think these two are the prerequisites. And out of all the projects that I've seen, I think really it's uh, Ethereum that has the best integration into these uh, ecosystems. Because when, when you build it in, uh, you not only have access to the users, but it's very important to have um, uh, developers build for you. And um, at least without these two uh, uh, very important things, um, it's very hard to get traction. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
definitely improved uh, fiat onboard, offboard rails and uh, user experience on mobile is definitely something that uh, we look forward to see improving over the time. Peko, maybe you want to share a little bit more also about the payment space and some of uh, maybe either elaborate on those problems or share some others. Right. Uh, thank you, Isaac. And um, for us, we uh, we coming from a countries and actually Pundia start uh, in Indonesia and where the most unbanked population is. And we figure out that we, before that we are doing QR code payment uh, in Indonesia. And then we found out that uh, actually people, as you said, that uh, uh, some of the um, people, they may not have a good phones um, like smartphones. Um, may, maybe some still using feature phone. So uh, we think of that um, since um, people can uh, have a very uh, uh, touch with the physical stuff. So we create the card. Oh, okay. So it's it's good. Yeah. So this card is a uh, Pundi's card, SPS card. So what we do is that we uh, people can deposit the card, uh, the crypto inside the cards and also to spend crypto with the cards, without phones. So all, all the um, mer uh, people to uh, have to do is to uh, have a merchant to have this device. Oops. Yes, so this is our device and it's placed in the merchant shop. So it's connected to the internet. So where the uh, merchant shop has a better um, uh, internet connection to complete the transactions. So uh, people just tap the card and then they can spend and spend crypto, pay crypto, top up crypto and all that. And the Bitcoin transaction um, for us is off chain. So it's quite uh, fast. It just uh, instantly confirmed as long as uh, um, the merchant space has a good internet on there for their SPOS device. So uh, we are trying to uh, solve the last mile issues, which is uh, how to get people uh, more easily to use uh, crypto because you have a very uh, deep, deep learning um, curve when you um, learn how to have a wallet. For example, you need to have a phone. Uh, you need to know what is private key. And then you need to have some crypto inside your wallet so that you can do transaction, right? So with this card, it's a, like a first step for them. They, and then they can migrate step-by-step step to a more decentralized uh, way, the wallet, blockchain wallet and all that. So so our, our uh, aim or mission is uh, to get those people to kind of crossing uh, the other side with this uh, simple uh, tools for them to use. Yeah, it's it, it's we work so hard, I guess, to help teach people about crypto, but actually, we really just want to like abstract the crypto out of there. I often will uh, will tell people because they're just like, I don't get it, I don't understand, and like then you'll work with people in the space and they don't get it either. Like it's just really confusing, and that's okay. Uh, in the same way, when you like send your email, you don't need to know about like internet packets and security and all the you know it works i click this i get that when the light goes on it does if it doesn't i call the electrician you know he knows why it works um i know not to touch it um i guess uh robert had an interesting point like um the kind of ethereum king and and the accessibility and and a lot of these these different things that we're trying to work through and the tools that have been built already on ethereum um, Hoy, what are some of the things at Cardia Chain that you guys are doing to help kind of build that accessibility or, or overcome that as, let's say, an, a non-ETH chain? Thank you. So I do agree with Robert that a good technology is the one that people doesn't need to understand the, the underlying behavior, right? Internet or electricity, most of people doesn't even know what, what it means, but uh, how it does, but but I just enjoy the service. So at Cardia, we, uh, we, 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 we try to approach with the same uh, method. Uh, thinking. So um, we try to build all the apps, uh, all the solution in such a way that people doesn't even care or know if it is blockchain. Um, we, we try to create uh, layers of, you know, the, the user behavior, the user password, and then we embed in that the wallet, uh, uh, the, the, the public address. 
Um, so if you are just a normal user, you can just easily download our you know, membership or wallet uh, and then you, you can just use it normally. Uh, but then if you really want to know the underlying behavior uh, and want to keep your own private key like a true crypto uh, you know, holder, then you can expose all of those information and use it. So um, of course, um, the, the whole you know, um, crypto population today is still very small compared to the non-crypto population, not even to mention the traditional businesses, right? Um, so um, we, we, we try to onboard the, the non-crypto people onto blockchain through the most simple way possible. Uh, that is to acquire the end user. So now when we work with current enterprise, the way career chain approach is that we provide a library, uh, the API, the integrations, SDK, so that normal apps can easily, you know, uh, get the module in, in blockchain if they want to. You could have the same app that you have before, just that you're going to have a component that integrate into blockchain to expose anything you want it. For example, if an e-commerce platform would like to integrate into blockchain to you know, make all of their transaction transparent, the user transparent to, to any uh, other users, then they just need to integrate that particular transaction point into our blockchain. And, and we will keep all of the record for them and show it to any other third party if needed. So in, in a way, it's transparent to, to any normal end user. It is the same as if it was before, just that the underlying technologies uh, is built on blockchain. And, and we do believe that sooner or later, um, you will see everywhere the technology is just embedded into your, your, your solution or your application, right? You couldn't ask too much about whether Google is using your, the AI to do search or, or to recognize you know, friends or things like that anymore. And I think ultimately in a few years, we will reach that point. Yeah, yeah, it's about, um, I guess, uh, baby steps and uh, the kind of concept of switching your entire infrastructure or the way you live to something new isn't necessarily um, the, the right jump, but maybe we want to have a payment that uses blockchain and a video game thing that uses blockchain and some artwork that has some blockchain features and and slowly we start to have it be part of our daily lives, you know, like the internet uh, or other, you know, uh, cell phone, 5G, 4G, people just kind of use it in our daily conversations. Um, so I guess um, what uh, we're, we're heading towards the kind of uh, end of the session, um, maybe um, uh, Hoi, you want to share a little bit more about um, the end of, you know, 2020 kind of locked down the whole country or all the countries, 2021, things are like starting to open up. Maybe things are, you know, uh, in flux right now. What, um, what, can we, what can we be excited for uh, for this year from Cardia Chain? What are some of kind of the big, uh, the big uh, changes that we can kind of look forward to. So indeed, um, in Vietnam, we didn't have a uh, too bad uh, COVID year. Like uh, most of Vietnam wasn't locked down until very recently. So life was as normal. But, um, but the rest of the world was ties up in a, in a bad phase. And in general, that will affect everything, right? So I think uh, most of people uh, knows more about blockchain lately, or at least, uh, you know, try to learn more about blockchain lately due to the rise of Bitcoin, right? Um, so we had a few very good months where, where you know, the, 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 the public awareness is, is high, right? People are excited. They try to learn more about all of what we are doing uh, in particular and blockchain technology is doing in general. We see more of uh, those forums or conference uh, than meets up, than the groups that people is talking about uh, how blockchain is going to change the world. For, for us, though, at Cardia, we have a very uh, clear roadmap and vision that we have been executed through bear market or through bull market. Uh, we, we think that the, the, the most exciting thing for Cardia in, in, in 2021 and beyond will be the Kaiser product, a roadmap that we can continue to deliver and uh, small step, baby step at, at a time. 
but the more population, the more you know enterprise um, uh, cooperation that use our technologies, the more awareness that we can bring into the people in Vietnam to start with, and then Southeast Asia at some point uh, will be the thing that we're more decided for. So we uh, we, we we believe that once um, we believe that. Um, Sooner or later, in, in, in a few years, technologies like blockchain, uh, particularly, will, will be the central point, will be the focus point. And we want to be one of the pioneer, one of the first one to, to have a working product uh, by then. So I think product-wise, adoptions and awareness is what we're super excited about. Nice, nice. Always, always good to, to be able to, to ship those products. Um, I guess there's sort of an ethos of uh, hype the bull, build the bear. Um, uh, but good that good that you guys are always in biddle mode and always focus on uh, shipping shipping new uh, new things. Um, so so Peko, we you, we were actually chatting earlier, and you mentioned uh, having some new partners in uh, Puerto Rico and having all these different places globally that you guys are kind of. Uh, integrating your uh, point of sale solutions. So do you want to share a little bit more about uh, 2021 and what you're excited about? Sure. Um, I think uh, 2021 is quite special for us uh, because in 2020, um, it's a big hit uh, all, all over the world, uh, especially in, in the, the large market like US, Brazil, uh, they closed down for COVID. And now in 2021, and since the vaccine starting to roll out and the things get uh, better and better. And uh, during the past few months, we have very, very busy about meeting distributor, especially master distributor. They are uh, going to deploy a large amount of uh, point of sales device in their market. I think it's very, um, very good to see this sign because in before, before we, when we roll out the product and people actually doesn't really understand what cryptocurrency is. And now when we were talking to them and they were actually very much uh, aware of this space and they, they are willing to build uh, together with us. So um, I think the difference is that uh, the mindset is different. Also uh, is spread to the normal people like, um, like restaurant owners, like um, the retail space. So uh, when we talk to them, we were feel like, wow, uh, this is going to be a mainstream adoption. <laughs> this is going to, this is coming. And so that's why uh, I'm sharing that uh, there are many countries that we are onboarding, uh, including uh, Puerto Rico, uh, maybe Australia, maybe New Zealand uh, coming up soon. And um, there are many uh, in the pipeline and we're very excited that uh, there are there are the merch uh, master distributor that are going to go through the process with us, and they are very aware of the regulatory issues as well. And um, I think the 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 things in in twenty twenty one is mostly to roll out uh, the, the 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 solution that we have right now, and with the regulatory as aspect in there, and they are very much aware of that, so that they can. Uh, sustain the business and also to get the government support uh, for what they are doing. And also, we're also seeing the, uh, the trend that uh, for those who have been in this, uh, in this space for quite maybe one or two years, they are starting to move towards to decentralized way. And as you see, the DeFi space is, is booming and uh, it's got quite a lot of interest. And also the same with uh, some of our existing uh, customer, they are moving towards to DeFi space. So that's why we're um, developing our product uh, to offer more DeFi service and also uh, the blockchain service that they would like to adopt. So I think uh, in 2021, it will be a mix of the people. Um, some of the people, they're moving, getting ready to move more to the DeFi space. And some of them like uh, join this, uh, this space. So it is quite uh, interesting to see this happen. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a good point. It's also a big shift we've seen kind of um, with Fuse in the last year um, as, COVID broke out around the world. Um, 
people's interest in alternative forms of payments and not touching money uh, became much more popular. Uh, and at that same time, uh, the infrastructure and pools for decentralized finance, for DeFi, for yield farming and lending and staking and all these things became so accessible. And so it was actually this um, really opportune time of combining these two, uh, these two aspects, right? Like people don't want to touch money. People don't trust their local currency. People want these alternative methods of payments. And all of a sudden you can make yield that was unheard of in the traditional finance. Um, and we can combine them together. Um, so I guess, Robert, maybe uh, it's, a, it's a good time for you to chime in on maybe some of the infrastructure that we're building out now uh, at Parth Labs in order to, let's say, uh, appease this massive uh, growth in the space. Well, I would say most of the crypto products, uh, crypto uh, trends until now have been targeted at the individual. For example, you know, uh, <clears throat> um, crypto until now has been a big play on uh, social mobility. It's about a bunch of young guys believing in something and, uh, and benefiting from that. Um, <clears throat> but uh, as I said, it's really targeting the individual. Uh, if you want to speculate, if you want to invest, if you want to transfer funds, um, uh, not only that, but uh, you know, uh, store of value. Uh, and also DeFi targets the individual. Um, I have some money, or in this case, I have some crypto and I, and I want a return on it. But I think starting in 2021, the conversation has to be, how can we apply this to society as a whole? How can we make society more inclusive, more efficient and fairer? Um, I think this is in the, the direction that we're headed in, uh, but it's only the beginning of a conversation. Yeah, I guess um, we, we kind of touched on baby steps before. So uh, we have this concept of, uh, helping yourself and then figuring out how those tools work and being able to use that to, uh, to help others. Um, uh, it, it definitely, definitely exciting times uh, and, and great to see so many different companies approaching the same, uh, the same or similar problems uh, in different ways and focused on maybe different uh, different communities or aspects or different groups of people. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone for joining and Leia and the um, SCC community for having us. And uh, yeah, look forward to uh, staying in touch. And I, I assume our uh, contact information will be shared after. So if anyone uh, wants to ping us, uh, definitely feel free to reach out. Thank you, Isaac. Yeah. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.